I have parents that come in and they can't afford to put their kid in any kind of sport. My rule is very simple. One, you got to make sure your kids have school and education. Make sure they're doing great in school. Two, make sure they have food and make sure you pay the rent and stuff first. Don't worry about your martial art. As long as your kid can come and once they come, they submit, they, they work hard. If you don't have money to offer, that's fine. Hey, what's happening, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. And on today's episode, I'm joined by Samuel Yen. Thank you for being here. We had a great time yesterday at Free Training Day Pacific Northwest and more interviews coming out of that. If you're new to the show, make sure you check out whistlekick.com for everything we do for the martial arts industry. We are here to connect, educate, and entertain all of you out there. Whistlekickmartialartsradio.com for everything relating to this show, the number one traditional martial arts podcast in the world. Very proud of that. And this episode is sponsored by Kataro, K-A-T-A-A-R-O.com for the absolute best martial arts belts in the world. They do, they do something cool. If you buy a belt from them and, and you put stripes on it, if you promote, you can send it back to them. They'll put another stripe on it for free. Like they do some really neat stuff like that. Yeah, they're a great company and, and just love having their support. I'm wearing a Kataro hoodie. They do great rank certificates and other awesome stuff. Keychains that'll reflect your, your rank, things like that. So make sure you check them out at their website and use the code WK10 to save 10% on your first order but Samuel thanks for being here thank you I appreciate you you dressed up for the show yeah hey, <laughs> you dressed up <laughs> just got out of church just got out of church no it yeah. wasn't for me and, and um but it was great meeting you yesterday and and you know there's something that tends to happen at free training day events we we hadn't met before yesterday right have we met our first one, our first time last year. Okay, okay, yeah. we did meet last year. Yeah, we okay. met last year, but we didn't get to communicate that much. Right, there's not much connection. Okay, but this year we. Yeah, did a little and, bit. and I, yeah, you and, and and Michael, who I just talked to, and, and a few others. It doesn't feel like we don't know each other. It feel yeah. like I know you, not right. not because I know your history, right. but just there's something about certain people when they come to these events i'm like yep this person belongs here and i'm, I'm glad they're here and i had that feeling with you so yeah same nice. here likewise yeah. likewise yeah and you 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 know you getting these things going and uh and help us in the northwest so we appreciate that thank you very much sure, for sure. Uh, introducing us in a free training program like this yeah appreciate that yeah well i i, I want to make sure that i recognize jen who is out there as well as Gabe and Jenny, you know, we wouldn't, we wouldn't have these events. And of course, right. CJ and, and here at Kiai Martial Arts, you know, getting to use this space and it's, it's fun. It's fun getting this stuff going and watching, watching people show up to these events the first time and they're kind of, they're kind of nervous, right? They're kind of, yeah. Uh, I'm not really sure what kind of people are going to be here because so many of us and, and, you know, we're going to talk about ego later. We're going to record an episode after this that will air on the subject of ego. Because what if there's a lot of ego when you show up? And right, and and just the way, just that noise you made, that just right, that noise, that noise says a lot. And I think for a lot of us, having to navigate the ego side of the martial arts world is exhausting. It is. You, you get you get stressed out. <laughs> One you out big time, real quick. Yeah. But of course, it's a martial arts event, and let's let's start here and see where this takes us. Right. When did you start training? I started training. Well, the history back in World War Two. I mean, not World War Two, but Vietnam War, Cambodia. I was gonna War. say World War Two. You look good. You look really <laughs> good for World War Two. <laughs> yeah. um, I would say started back in nineteen. Uh, 78 and uh, because of a Cambodian war I was captured in a Cambodian field in a killing field mm -hmm. and then when uh, 1977 the Viet Cong start flying over and uh, 
fire, you know, airplane mm -hmm. coming into the camp because we have war at that time called Killing Field. And I was one of the young kids that was captured doing the I escaped from Vietnam because my parents were the South Vietnamese Army. Mm -hmm. They were, my dad was a captain, my mom was a major, and uh, they were the MP. And MPs normally, if you're in charge and you capture the enemy, you interrogate. And our family was meant to be executed. So I escaped to Cambodia as a young boy. At the time, I was only, uh, I would say, around six and a half. And once I was captured, I was nine. And then uh, when the Viet Cong come in and fight, and we were trained to be soldiers and trained to fight, our job was setting up landmine and out in the wood and and uh, putting bullet in the clip, cleaning the, uh, the soldier's weapon, and do whatever we gotta do to, is to survive. Because the thing is, you don't cry, you don't laugh, no, no enjoyment in life, then they won't execute you. If they see any of that, they execute you. So our job, when they start training for fighting, for military, all kids, females and boys, all go out and train. And then uh, when the airplane, when the Viet Cong start to attack, then a lot, of, a lot of people die. So kids were running and my thing was to try to escape. And there's 10 of us, five got blown up by landmine and I um, survived through the landmine. I got a few scrap through and, and uh, shot and escaped on a bullet. And then we keep running, no matter what, keep on running. And we run to a Thailand border. And there I was in a refugee camp in Thailand border. And then uh, I was one of those young boys, very clever and uh, very alert, observe. And the key is survival mode, is searching for food and water supplies and stuff. So we make it to the border and we managed to find a camp at the border. We stay there. And then later on, we finally got to go into the big camp where we protected by Thai soldier. Well, they got Vietnamese camp, Chinese camp, and the Cambodian camp. The Cambodian camp was so big, so I sneak over to the Vietnamese camp and I'd stay there. And as a kid at that time, I was only 10 years old we make it there and I because I speak two three dang language and um, so I sneak from fence because they have wire fencing on each camp and they have row and Thai patrol every you know certain hour they patrol so if the Vietnamese people they need water I sneak over to the Cambodian and get water or supply because they got everything there they you know Thai soldier they sell it so I can go there and uh, trade. They know they call me a slicky boy <laughs> as a nickname. But one day I got captured. I got captured by Thai soldiers and two of Vietnamese kids. I was lucky enough my father taught me some from a Cambodian martial art. Okay. So took us to the camp, to the military camp, and it's right there, their little tiny base. But those guys the Thai soldiers, they just having fun. So they don't have any rooster to make a fight, mm -hmm. but they use us as a rooster fighter. So they, you know, some and of the- And you're 10 years old. Yeah, and some of the 10, uh, the Thai soldier kids that were there, they were trainers to be a Muay Thai fighter and they all have skill already. So three of us, some of the two Vietnamese boys got in there, they got their butt whoop and everything. And in my turn, I stick around. I got two rounds out of it and see the scar right here. Yeah. That's the scar that I always remember when that young man elbowed me. I was just going to say that. That looks like an elbow. And from that day on, after that, I, they, you know, lost it. I lost the fight. But mm -hmm. Then they took us back to camp. They say, if you tell what we do, we come back and kill you. So, um, first thing I did, I tell, you know, 
Dalton camp, and then next thing you know, in the Cambodian camp, they know it too, in the Chinese camp. So what they do, they have an area where the Thai people let us come together and just, you know, fellowship for a certain hour only. So they come out and they say, all the kids come out and train. So we got Buvinam, we got Khmer, Bogota, only few that can teach, whoever can teach. They come out and we start training. And that's where my martial art began. Mm. And, and that was in was 79. The, okay. The intent of that training, mm -hmm. was it because these folks knew what was going on with the kids and they wanted to keep you safe? Or was it to occupy time? Uh, they want to prepare us. They don't want to, you know, see us. I told them exactly what they did to us because they use us as a human cop fight. Yeah. And if this keep going, because the so soldier, they were making bet mm. on it. So that's, and then, um, and, and when I tell them that and stuff, so they say, okay, let's train our kids how to defend ourselves, learn how, give them some mm -hmm. kind of, uh, preparation or preparing for learning how to defend anything then better than nothing. Mm -hmm. So that's why all the kids start training. And then uh, from and, that on... And I think I heard you say in a variety of martial arts. Yep, yep. We have Vubinam there, Vietnamese martial art. We have Chinese Kung Fu. We, so because a lot of us, uh, a lot of those elder guys, they were ex-military or because they all refugees to escaping from war. Mm -hmm. So they know how to fight some kind of training, you know. So those who have skill, they come out and they train us a little bit here and there. But most of us get sponsored. Some of us don't get sponsored. We get to stay there. And um, if you don't, if you, at that time, if you don't have any kind of guardian or anything in refugee camp, the Thai would send you to an island. It's called the lost the island for children mm -hmm. and then they put you on that island and then later on when you become um, a, you know a certain age they they can bid you off or sell you or you become a slave to sex slave or whatever that that's was later but then in the early day later on I find out they shut that down mm -hmm. But then I got sponsored and get shipped off. So I went to Bangkok and then went to uh, Philippines for two weeks. And then they shipped me to an island called Galang. Galang Island is an old Japanese military base when uh, World War II. And then they turned those Japanese base is cargo. They turned that into a bunker, living quarter mm -hmm. for a refugee camp from Vietnam and Cambodia. There's two, uh, two camps. Uh, Galang 1 and Galang 2 island. It was actually that is my favorite island and that's where I first saw Bruce Lee's movie and uh, that's where I really fall in love in martial art mm -hmm. and uh, I remember that day we me and a kid he's Chinese uh, Chinese Vietnamese and um, they were very successful and there was a girl we fight over. And here we are, two kids fighting. And I remember that boy throw a sidekick and I block like Bruce Lee, jump back and block it. And whoop, and I hit back. And then, you know, and all the adults, they all run out and just make a big circle and just watching two kids fighting, having, you know, a blast. And how, how old were you at that point? At that time, I, I was just 10 and a half. Okay. Yeah, 10 and a half. And then, um, um, so that's where, um, yeah. After, but you're smiling when you talk about this. It's very different than because the other fight you were talking about. Well, those uh, other fight is, is enjoyable. The reason I'm, I've been a fighter all my life because when Viet, when Viet Cong took over our country in South Vietnam, they come in, the children are very brutal. They throw rock at us and stuff. It's just like, in the south you know if you're raised in the south you should know there's races but they you know they always pick a fight and i i'm a type of person that if i can't win i throw a rock at you or i'll shoot you with my slingshot that was my thing mm -hmm. and that's how i defend my 
my family and friends and stuff when I was in Vietnam, when our enemy invaded. No, it's 1976, uh, 75, 76, 75, we lost Saigon, we lost Vietnam. 76, they start coming in, slave everybody, Deacon Trance and everything for almost a year. And that's when we escaped, I escaped with my cousin. And uh, yeah, and uh, the martial art was there began. And then when I came to the United States in 1980, I finally make it to the United States. So you're 11, 12? 11, 11 and a half. How, how did, how did, were you sponsored? Yeah, okay. I was, I was sponsors and uh, got over here. I was supposed to go to Paris. The reason I didn't get to go to Paris, I almost got to go to Paris because in 19, uh, I was in uh, Vietnamese camp and uh, I was up on a water towel at, in, in a camp. At night, every every hut that we have, we dig a hole in the middle because at night the Cambodian, the red Cambodian, they would shoot in bullet at night. So we gotta jump in the hole and cover, take cover. Yeah, and uh, that's the reason. And then once once we survived from it, then uh, went to. Uh, Galang Island, then that's where the mentality of survival kick in. So at that time, no matter what, I wasn't afraid to get hurt or die at the refugee camp in Galang because I learned how to survive. The waterfall, the fishing and stuff is beautiful. I love it. That's why you asked me why I smile because when I, when I fight that boy, I fight for that girl. Mm. And... She, you know, I fight for that girl. I almost end up to go to Paris because one day the taxi cab pulled up at the refugee camp in, in Thailand. There's a French family came out and there was a young girl who was beautiful, blonde hair and everything. Man, I was up in the water town and I could see everything. So I ran down and you know how, you know, us Asian, we don't see a lot of American people, mm -hmm. you know, except during wartime, but the civilian, we don't get to see that much. So it was a French family to come down to see, have found any kids that belong to French family mm -hmm. that was killed and some of the boys and kids that were French. And everybody following and I look at it, I go, man, look at it. That girl got blonde hair, blue eyes. I'm going to marry me one of those. That's what I told them. I, I, you know, I, I'm going to marry one of those. And then as they get in the taxi cab, they about to take off. And I, I was like in the crowd and I run up and they got them. And I go, au revoir, monsieur, au revoir. That means goodbye. Mm -hmm. and, you know, at that time, I'd speak a little bit of language of everywhere because here's the thing. Survival, you, everywhere you go, you learn something, the culture in the language. So they stopped and they started to get out and then started coming toward me and I got spooked. So I took off and ran. <laughs> That's why I say I, I almost ended up. You, you might Paris. have gone to Paris. Yeah, I almost ended up going to Paris for free. But you know, I don't have to wait for no sponsor mm. or nothing. <laughs> but I ended up in Sacramento in 1980. Um, late 80, um, three months later, um, my father, he escaped in 75, um, he had his own unit, they couldn't fight anymore because they don't have any more bullet or any artillery to fight. So they hop on an American PT boat and they hop up to Thailand with his soldiers and he said about 150 soldiers with him couple boats they took off to Thailand. They have only one machine gun on each boat and that's it. And the rest they, they left behind. Um, when I escaped and then they finally released my mom because they were supposed to execute my mom. But my mom was pregnant so they didn't execute her. After she delivered my younger brother then she ended up in prison working in trance, PO, POW, for a year and a half, I think. And after that, they released her. And I already escaped and gone. 
And when I, um, when he found me in 1980 in Sacramento, everybody say my father's dead, but I said, no, nah, my dad's not dead. I'm the only one who's feeling, you know, he's mm -hmm. not dead. And then um, <clears throat> taxi cab pull up, there he is. Find me and brought he found it, my father. He pulled up and I looked out the window. And I saw a taxi cab and I looked, that's my dad. I run out, see him. And I, so he took me back to Louisiana and. Okay, that's and, where. <laughs> I, was, I was wondering where we were going to get to the, the, the southern drawl. Yeah. I was wondering where that was coming in. So I went up in Louisiana and lived there and, and then we stayed there for until 1981 and then. Later on, I was going to summer school, learning how to speak English and everything. And then I ended up in, uh, then 92, we moved to Magnolia, Arkansas and opened up the first Chinese restaurant there. My dad does. And, uh, and that's where I learned most of my, you know, English. Mm -hmm. And we back and forth to Louisiana. We got both home and, uh, martial art was still training. I was, I still train what I have, and then I start studying Kung Fu, um, and then the animal system, and then later um, <clears throat> I pick up um, Tai Chi Jiu Jitsu um, back in uh, early 80, 85, mm -hmm. and then in 91, that's when I started studying Gojuru. Gojuru Karate, 91, right after service. I, 91, I went to join the United States Air Force, got out. I got hurt. I didn't last long. Mm -hmm. I didn't last long because at that time, I was one of those kids that angry yeah. at, the, at the things that are going on around the world because when I first came to the United States, my first instinct was to learn. I learned the language. I learned the history. I learned history, what make an American, what make GI great, what what make an American great. So I start studying, studying leaders, George Washington, Eisenhower, and you Ulysses, and all those guys that have war history. And you know, my favorite is MacArthur or Patton. You know, I start studying about those guys, and then that gave me a great history of understanding what it takes to be American. So, and I wrote that in my senior year and a teacher, she read my story because I wrote a story about, about myself, freedom in the eyes of a child. When we make it through the camp, the things we, you know, about 20 of us, once the enemy attacked at the border of Thailand, we saw the Red Cross at the camp. So any of you ever watch Mask, the move, the show Mask, like in that, I don't know, you know, mm -hmm. with the helicopter and everything mm -hmm. doing a Korean War? It was one of my mother's favorite shows when it's, I was growing up. It's, it's the same image, mm -hmm. similar to it. Imagine the eyes of a child seeing that kind of camp. Yeah. with the Red Cross is a sign of freedom. Mm -hmm. That's why when that, it gave us hope. That's why 20 of us survive, help each other survive. We got kids get their skin all burned, my skin all burned up, and we roll on the ground to put out the, the flame. We put grab clay from the mud and we rub on it to keep our body cooling down from the, mm -hmm. from the metal, from the landmine. And we have kids that uh, dragging an arm and no legs and stuff. So we help each other to survive, to camp at that time. But then make it to Magnolia, learning English. They throw me in fourth grade and I couldn't hold a day on pencil. I never had education during the war time. Never get a chance to go to school or anything. But martial art was always been in my heart to defend myself. Because uh, they throw me in fourth grade and lunchtime, kid be eating lunch and stuff, I'll be snoring. Because 12 o'clock is my sleeping time in Vietnam. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, and... Uh, so so let, let me ask yeah. you a question. Because, you know, I've, I've had some friends that 
they didn't have a normal childhood. You know, not yeah. not as as dramatic as what you're talking about, but it seems like when you take a child and you take away a lot of their childhood, and you're, you're talking about being, if I'm doing the math right, five six years old with a slingshot, mm-hmm. right? That that's that's having a lot of your youth taken away. Coming to the U.S. and and going into school, going into fourth grade, I imagine you still saw most of the world as where, where is the threat? What am I, where's the, you know, the landmine? Where's the person that's trying to kidnap me? Mm-hmm. It must've been difficult to shut that off. It, it take, well, when, when my father found me, um, it took almost six months because half the time my mom, my stepmom would find me under my bed. And, you know, because uh, nightmare and yeah. things that still haunt me in my memory. And she would find me sweating in the night, dreaming, uh, because seeing all the people that would kill and suffer. Um, the thing that changed my life, like I say, I wrote a story about the freedom of the, you know, in the eyes of a child. Um, my teacher, my Miss, um, my uh, reading class teacher, she read it and she said, I really like, because I wrote something and I said, in this world, there's not even one perfect man because mm-hmm. every man got hatreds. And, you know, it is from the anger of a child of, of my youth. And uh, I was, you know, but end up in uh, Magnolia, Arkansas, the first thing that is, you know, people never seen Asian people that, you know, never seen it. So a lot of black kids, they throw rock and white kids, they throw rock at us, at me and my stepsister. But they pick on the wrong guy. I throw rock back. Mm-hmm. I chase you down and I throw rock at you. And that's what I did. In fourth grade, they were picking on me all the time. But I didn't know. But every time I fight back, whatever, I get a spanking every day from the teacher. But they didn't tell my mom, but it didn't hurt me. It didn't face me because I'm used to those things. I get spanking every day. <clears throat> and then um, in 90, 92, no, 82, I was still cow, didn't, didn't speak much, didn't know much either about the United States. Um, think back now, it's funny. Um, the... El Radio Arkansas, they're having a parade. And I was like, wow, they all wearing clown masks and everything. They march in the parade. And I said, oh, let me go out. So I was my, so we were visiting a, a friend and, and I went out there and started walking behind them and waving at folks and everything. And then later on, find out that was a Cuckoo Clan parade. And I was marching at a Puka Camp parade. So now I was like, holy cow. Uh, you know, now I know, <laughs> didn't know what it means. I'm sure they must have been really unimpressed with you yeah. being there. Well, they were kind of like shocking. <laughs> like, what the hell is this little boy are doing walking behind our parade? So, you know, but I was just, thought it was just a friendly parade. How, and, how many, that, that's kind of fun. How many Asian kids have marched in a clan parade? I don't, don't think many. Many. I don't think just, only just, I was the only one, I reckon. <laughs> but uh, that was in El Dorado, Arkansas. And uh, it, it, in in the South, racing up in the South is is different. Mm-hmm. Down there is, uh, you know, growing up and making friends and stuff because a lot of folks, they never seen you. And then uh, after I wrote that sentence, and the teacher tell me, you know, I really like your story. But I just want to tell you this. There's one man that is perfect, and that is Jesus. And with me and my attitude at that time, it was hate and anger and everything. And I'd say, who is this Jesus? Why he's perfect? Mm-hmm. So she told me. And she asked me what I'm going to do this Sunday. I said, I'm at my dad's restaurant helping out. Um, so he said, why don't you come to church? What's church? So she come and pick me up and invite me to church. And that's where my life changed. It changed me, like you asked me earlier, mm. how the aspect of a childhood have no childhood memory except 
what I have is different. Oh, that was taken away. I learned to let go. I learned what I find peace. I find peace in Jesus. And that's where it began in my life. And that was my senior year. My senior year. And then I found the thing that she taught me is say, no matter where you go or whatever you do, whatever become your life, you always remember Jesus loves you and he's there and he's willing to change. If you remember that name, you just call on him. Mm-hmm. He, he will change your life. So I didn't, you know, I keep that in mind, but I went joining the military, joined the United States Air Force. Then I got hurt right after boot camp. And then we got out of boot camp. We graduated from it. And then uh, ready, ready, go through a ready center. Uh, they give you ready center to train you, get ready to ship you off to your mission. Um, my mission was I'm a military in peace, security, just like my parents. Um, Did you want that role because of them? Yeah, yeah, I do. And martial art was training hard. I still train, and um, and um, from there, because of one rock, it changed my whole career. We were doing five mile run with full gear on, and we rested. And then as soon as I stand up, there's a rock with under pine, bunch of pine leaf. It twists my legs and it mm. broke it. So my squadron were gone, different, and then they recovery, and then they say, you can retrain and send you to the new unit with no squadron. And, you know, and I say, hell no, I'm done with my attitude at that time, young time, you know, I, and then I end up back to Nashville, Arkansas. That's where the Goju kick in. That's where I found my Goju instructor, Terry Reed. He uh, helped me to understand. We was uh, in Yamaguchi system at that time. Mm-hmm. And then um, learning go through on him. And that's where the Wolf Dojo began. And uh, I always adopt that. And he accepted me. And the thing about in Nashville, Arkansas, that's where I really got into religion more because there, after the service come home, you got no family, you got nobody there for you. So, and uh, I stay in a hotel, and and I saw there's a Bible there. It's called a Gideon Bible. A Gideon Bible was the only Bible that was uh, published for the Vietnam War. And here I am, I eating hamburger every day, and then working for a Bill Poland weed year plan. That was 1992. And then I was like, then I found out my older brother died in Vietnam. And then I was like, sad. My life was like a mess. And so I started thinking about suicide. And then I was like, no, I went through a lot in my lifetime. I don't want to give up this way. And then I remember what she say. Remember on Jesus name. So I look at the Bible and I hold up and I say, Lord, I don't know who you are. I really don't. If I open this door and you if I can walk to it and I'm gonna go and I'm gonna wash my clothes and you get it dry by morning, I get dressed and I go to any church you send me to and I'm gonna find out about you and get to know you. Mm-hmm. So it was United Pentecostal Church in Little Nashville, Arkansas. So I walked through it, walked to it, and people looked at me like they never seen it, like like a western movie when a cowboy walk into a saloon and a Everybody stop and just look. So the service stop and they, they're all looking at me. <laughs> I walk in and say, they, they never have a color book coming in their church before. So uh, I walk in, I say, excuse me, is this okay for me to come in to learn about this Jesus? They accepted me. They welcomed me. It's United Pentecostal Church in Nashville, Arkansas. And that's in February, February the 14th, 19th. 14, 1992, I got saved on February, um, on Valentine's Day. That's where I be born again and become saved. And then 
And you've got the same smile talking about this that you had yeah. talking about that fight, yeah. right? You know, fo yeah. um, folks that are watching are seeing yeah. you smile as you talk about certain things, but the folks that are listening, you know, they're not seeing that difference in your face, but I see it. I see yeah. the difference as you talk about this. Yeah. So that's where it changed in uh, my life's change. And then being a Pentecostal is totally different. And I <laughs> don't see people, but the key is they take me in, they teach me the word. And they, they guide me, they help me to understand. And my heart was on fire, just changing. Then I studied karate, I met Terry, and first I I heard him. He was, you know, Goju, but I studied, you know, I put a skull on him for six months. He, he, you know, never met him, trained with him first day, and then I kind of put a hurt on him. <laughs> I didn't mean to. But, so, so, so let me ask you mm -hmm. about your martial arts training, because I'm, I'm imagining... You know, you're you're talking about your, your your first examples of training were out of necessity. You had to train, or at least felt you had to train, because of the environment that you were in. And you come to America, where at least compared to your childhood, things are really safe, mm -hmm. and most people are doing martial arts for very different reasons. It's interesting, or they see it more as a sport, or it's a hobby. When you started training in the U.S., were you still training for the same reasons? Did you still did you feel I need this? I need to keep myself safe, or had you had you found enough, I guess, comfort that you could approach it more with other intent? Well, first, first it was in more of intense it's more of defense because at that time remember you're a color boy living in the south sure i always say you're a little squirrel living in a white man's world we're trying to get a nut no matter what but that's what's my line I always say that because um i trained at that time and then later on uh i find peace in christ and the training started to become more peaceful now mm -hmm. It start changing my tactic of understanding why am I training hard, and then um, training to become a fighter and defend and all that. And then I, I do all that. Um, it changed me because I'm not there to hurt anyone anymore. Because God find you know helped me to change that. I find my peace. Um, but there is time because you always look. You always have people big and tall. We're always challenged, yeah. Because, you know, no matter where you go, you're going to have comment or people threaten you. Mm -hmm. And uh, for being a little guy, you got to, you got to, there's a thing. We we hit hard and we block soft. <laughs> so we hit, once you hit it, you want to make sure you break that son of a gun. And that way they don't come back. <laughs> You got to hurt him, at least let him know, that, you know, like I always say, you can push an ant to, to the corners so many times. You can only push ants a certain point. He will turn around and bite you no matter how big and small he is. Mm. So that's, you know, you, and that's where I learned to forgive. You, you learn how to let go and you learn how to smile and laugh. The reason I'm, you all, you ask me, you can see the smile in a different, because remember I told you from the beginning, I came from a place where war, when they see a child that's crying, laughing, smiling, they execute you. And you know how they execute you? They can beat you, they can take a back. I remember the back is normally green or blue, like a grocery garbage bag, grocery uh, bag from Safeway. Mm -hmm. They cover it over your head and suffocate you. That's why when I see the joy in my life now is to smile for those children, for those kids that didn't make it. Every time I do things, I let that become the joy of my heart, my life. And now I'm in the ministry. I'm also a minister mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> because uh, Nashville church and I was on fire and 
I work with children. I'm in the youth ministry, and uh, I help kids build up their um, their low self-esteem. So I own a dojo here in uh, Tacoma. I'm also with APC. APC is an Asian Pacific Culture Center. We represent 47 different countries, Islander and Asian. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I have a martial arts school there. I teach on Monday and Wednesday. And my program is very easy, is to help lower income family that cannot afford for their kids to involve in any kind of sport. Mm -hmm. I have kids, I have parents that come in and they can't afford to put their kid in any kind of sport. My rule is very simple. One, you got to make sure your kids have school and education. Mm -hmm. Make sure they're doing great in school. Two, Make sure they have food and make sure you pay the rent and stuff first. Don't worry about your martial art. As long as your kid can come and once they come, they submit, they they work hard. If you don't have money to offer, that's fine. When you have money, pay if you can. If you don't, that's, you know. Yeah. But the key about my dojo is to help family and help kids. You can bring in kids that cannot stand. You can't bring in kids that can't even get along or can't even speak so shy and stuff. And you see the beauty when you mold yourself. You work with that kid and you got to learn patience. And you, when you see the joy and the ability to change that in them, it makes you feel, I make a difference in that kid's life. And that's what being a sensei, a teacher, and I learned that not because I have any great teacher I got good uh, foundation through the people that I interact with in my life. Uh, I have, you know, like I say, I, I share with you that I like history. Mm -hmm. I have encountered my life with majors, colonel, general, that serve under great, great people. I have met a gentleman, the right hands of MacArthur. Mm -hmm. I have met a general that was the second wave of airplane that's supposed to drop on Japan, the atomic bomb, the second wave, not the first wave, the second wave. He was ready. Um, so those people that I encountered inspire me to change and different. And um, even my father-in-law, my first wife, father-in-law, he was a command master sergeant. He encouraged me. and. Uh, inspired me in my life so the change so martial art it helped me to mold characters of a student it's not money making i'm not about money making so the good lord will always provide no matter what but the thing is you make a difference in those kids life i have kids come in since they i'm hungry what are you gonna do uh, your mom don't feed you boy what no no okay come on over here i'll buy you something to eat. You know, and we have kids that come in, don't have shoes, don't have uniform. I buy a uniform, I have them, and I have student. My senior student have about 100-some student in Renton. Um, I have a few black belt that help me out, and my senior black belt, they, you know, the good old always provide. And we got uniform, and kids come in, you know, parents don't have money to offer, but just as long as they come. Yeah. And that's my program for APC. And, um, you know, I'm glad you guys are doing this for free for people out there that wanted to train, wanted to get involved, to wanted to grow. Back in my day, we pay $150 just for an hour with the head instructors yeah. and seminar. You know, my, uh, my instructor, I, I studied Gojuru and Ishinru. Oh. Yeah. I grew up with Ishinru, Yeah, Ishinru yeah. Karate. I studied under H.A. Uh, Avinkala, um, Command Master Sergeant and the Marine Corps. And um, and also Kerry Womack. I have many great peers that I trained under that was great Ishinru practicer. So, um, and uh, Karate helped me to mold my characters as when you place yourself humble, it go a long way. I learned to smile. 
it go a long way. It opened doors. Because where I've been through. I don't like bully. I deal bully all my life. But the thing is, you can take care of bully anytime. But there's a certain way you pop their bubble. Explore them. Then they change. A bully because people bully because they don't understand where they are mm. and they see the opportunity but if once you ex explain to them tell them hey man how you like to give it back the other way they're going to learn and it, it's an opportunity for them to change in their life and that's that's you know my martial art has taught me a lot of characters of being a person in my life because you're learning to change you learn to adapt the surrounding and um you know being a martial art instructor is see where your humble is where's your heart is and you know we always say mind body and spirit are one and that's why in Ishinu we have thing we call it one whole heart. Everything you do in your life, do it one whole heartly. Don't. That's why we always say, don't throw a weak punch. You throw that hard punch. You make sure you take care of that son of a gun. <laughs> so yeah, uh, we all have story. We do. We do. This was <laughs> yeah. This, this, this is a good story. So. A lot of people talk about, and of course, I'm as loud as any of them about the the benefits of martial arts, of traditional martial arts, and the way that we train and how it can help people grow. Mm -hmm. Of course, there are a lot of people out there who will say the same thing about faith, about mm -hmm. religion. We haven't had a ton of people on the show. In fact, I'm trying to think. I don't know that we've... No, I take it back. We've only had a few people who are lifelong martial artists and ministers. Mm -hmm. Talk to me about what you see as similarities in how religion and martial arts help people. Okay. Well, like I'd say, we build foundation, right? Mm -hmm. In karate, you got to have strong foundation. In karate. To make karate strong, once, like I say, I have students come in, they have no, um, they have very low self-esteem. So you got to develop skill and develop foundation then to make them strong. In a spiritual world, in a Christian world, you know, you teach them the word of God. The word of God is our foundation, mm -hmm. is the way of life. Without Jesus Christ, there's only one way. To heaven is I am the way the truth and the light nobody can go through me uh, everybody had to go through me before they can go to see the father so the map is already set for us to be free mm -hmm. we get only 120 years in life here on earth to change our life to change our way we all burn burn as a sinner God's not going to force you to become a believer. That's why he give us free choice. You know, many angels up there want to have what we have, but they can't. They are spiritual. Okay? We want what the angel have is being spiritual. But God give us the opportunity to learn to live freely with him. He want us to go home. That's why we get 120 years to change our way, to change our life. It's to accept that him. Only very simple. People don't understand it out there because all you got to do is accept Jesus Christ as your Savior and be believer. And that's the key. That's the bridge. That's the cross. That's the cross that he suffered for us. So we have that way. So when you have a strong foundation in karate, you have strong foundation in the spiritual, then you learn how to communicate with people to help people to mold their character we're not here to judge anyone we're not here to say oh you do it wrong but you know in 
you can see when your student do kata and you say, oh, that's wrong. Let me show you how to do it. That's you correcting them. It's the same thing. God is correcting us every day. When we sin, he had the Holy Spirit that help us to understand, hey, you didn't some, you, you know, you need to go over and tell that young man, I'm sorry. The hardest thing that I see people do in life is going up to another person and say, hey, I'm sorry, I'm wrong. When you submit yourself in certain things, it releases the spirit. It's a conquer, conquer that part of battle. A battle is where you stand. You you got to be strong in the spirit. That's why in the military, martial art is a military art, the art of war. It teaches you to mind, body, and spirit together. And that's why you got to have that foundation. In medieval time, we had warriors that served God with wholeheartedly. And there's honors. You know where the salute come from? You know why they salute? Why are we salute in the military? I don't think I do know. Okay. Well, in medieval time, night, when they fight each other, they're ready to, to jowl. They lift up this, they raise this shield. Is a sign of honor. I let you see me. If I show I die, honor me and respect me who I am. So when we salute, we show that person, you have my respect and honor mm -hmm. as a warrior. So that's why when we bow is a sign of honor and respect. So that's why we have that spiritual foundation in our martial arts. And that's why, you know, when I tell my student, all the black belts up here, they are eight, seven, done. They are officers that go through training, hardcore training in their lifetime to earn this knowledge and wisdom. Show respect. That's why, you know, uh, our generation is changing in martial art too, because you know, in tournament, we, I always, in my tournament, I always tell this student, this sensei, if you bring your student, make sure they come up, bow, and say, judges, show them respect. My name, my style, my kata. Very simple in every system. But nowadays, tournaments kind of seem like walking away from that. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, spiritual had a strong foundation in my life. Um, with the martial art, mm. and that put my heart to humble myself in uh, in the, that aspect, and that's how I help I help myself. Seem the Lord helped me to mold my student, to mold my character, the character of my student, mm. and you can see the different the change in that student. You know, um, we have student that gang members, and they have tough life. And they come, they develop, they change. Uh, that's why I... Um, hmm. I don't want to gloss over that. Okay. You have students that come in that are active gang members, mm -hmm. and you allow them to train with you. Yes. Talk about that, please. That, okay. That's, that's significant. Because a lot of gang members, they come in, they grow up in a rough neighborhood, all right? But the thing that I give them, because they come in, they... They challenge. They challenge your ability and your skill. That's the first thing they're going to do. And then you're going to have to put them in place and show them a few techniques that it work. It don't take much. And then uh, if they like it, they see, oh, man, I can't do this to him. Then, you know, make it where it's... Because when people come in, they challenge your skill and your ability is to see whether it work or not. And say, it's a baloney, you know? Oh, they just doing hop hop. No, once you show them reality, it's not that what it is. You know, I'm not show. I'm not doing that fancy flying kick and all that. No, I'm not going to do all that. Here, I'm going. I'm going to take this gang member that live in the street. They have a rough life already. They dealing with gang member. You know, they go out and hurting people left and right. And how can I mold this young man? Well, like I say, 
I take this spiritual word to help him as well, to mow him. I say, you know, how long will you, how long would you want to live that way? How long will you willing to do that? You know, I had a young man. He, he was, uh, what grade was it? Seventh grade. He was, gay. you know, he's a little guy. But he got a bunch of big guys. Wherever he go, he go with them. And whoever you want to point, he point and say, go beat him up. Mm-hmm. It's the same mentality in doing a uh, Cambodian war. Mm-hmm. In a Cambodian war, kids were like 14, 15 years old. They were officer. They out in the rice field and they walking around and they see they don't like this person or whatever. Oh, they got a point. They point that person, that person the adult, they, they go grab that person and then he tell them what to do. He execute them. Mm-hmm. So I see that. And I see that in those kids. And when that young man come in, a couple of gang members come in, I mow them. I train them. I even baptize them. Mm-hmm. <laughs> the key is um, you you make make them feel, you got to find a way to make peace with them and and make make them feel that make him feel you important to me i make that young man feel comfortable that i accepted who he is and i did i accepted him first and then i slowly mold him and once he accepted me then i'm in because once you see bad student or bad kids come in you start to push them away you're not doing anything. You, you're not. You're not doing the purpose of being an instructor. We are teacher. You are teachers. We. I learned to become a student, and I'm still always a student of of life and the word, and and that's what helped me to mold them. I teach, and I say. And the key is being a teacher is being open up your heart to that young man. If you open up your heart and you're willing to accept who he is, and then slowly they see the change, they see the love, then they're willing to, to say, you know, as I remember that young man later on, he changed. Those guys still hang around with him and stuff. They change too. They all marry and have kids now. And, you know, he, um, he working, you know, honest, making honest money. Back then, he beat those kids up and get their money. <laughs> Selling drugs in school and stuff. Those, you know, that's, you know, that's in Tacoma, you know. So let, let me ask you a question because we're going we're gonna to yeah. start to wind down. I think it would be really easy for most people to look at your childhood and say, I wish that hadn't happened to you. And and of course, I wouldn't want that to happen to anyone. But the childhood you lived gave you this understanding. And I suspect that you wouldn't change it because of what it's allowed you to do. Am I right? Yeah. You wouldn't go back, time machine, nothing. You wouldn't change any of that. I I wouldn't change it. But his, um, the thing is that I, since I become a, a Christian, is happening from the beginning. Um, let me take you back a little bit. Okay. After, after the invasion of Vietnam, 1975, and I was around seven years old, during the summer, we were playing soccer. I was the goalie. And, um, ball was kicking to me and I you know and it missed the goal and it rolled down but behind me this few uh, tombstone graveyard I went and get it but suddenly there was an old man sitting there white dressing white long beard white gray hair and I bowed to him I said you know in my language we would say we bow show respect and he 
called me to him. So I, I went over and he run his hand into my hair. He said, Gong Yai, good son, good, good son. And then he said to me, three things that he said to me. You will travel for places. Never, uh, you become different from your people. Never, ever let anyone hit on top of your head. Those are the three things he told me. To me, I got saved in nine, 1992. Yeah. I, didn't I didn't talk about war until 95. Yeah. I got saved and I start strong in belief. And then I start thinking back. That was God to me. That was my spiritual guide. And he's telling me, and all the things that happened in my life for the purpose of it is to make a difference in people's life. That was the beginning of my call. God chose certain people to become leaders and certain people to become guiders, teachers, and whatever it is in every field. God chose those people. I'm not saying that God chose God's that's why we have 120 years. God chose us. It's just a matter of time where we're willing to open up. And that's why I'm not going to change what had happened in my life. Is part of, As I'm looking back, those journey was a journey of testimony. Do you share your testimony, how God can change your life? Mm -hmm. And that's how I'm not going to throw gospel at you. And trying to make you the believer. No, we all have journey and time in our life to make that change. The key is live your life. Let that become the testimony of your life to help others to change their life. So God placed that in my life so I can learn and be strong and have uh, confidence mm -hmm. that I was never alone. I didn't know about that. I didn't know that was Jesus. Because during the war, after the war, we in my village, we have an old um, American military base there, a small one. But after the Vietnam War, they all left, and they left a lot of stuff back. And they left them, you know, stuff back. So the Viet Cong come in, and then they took everything. And then they sh one summer, they show a movie. And all of us go out, make us all go out to the village, go out in the rice field. We all sit out there, and then they hook up a big old screen, and they show us this movie. It was the Ten Commandments. At that time, I said, man, did you see that that demon, that the fire, it destroyed, you know, all the Egyptian? And we didn't know he was speaking English, so that was, you know. That's the beginning of the ministry. Mm. And imagine 2,000 people sitting on the rice field watching the three stooges and don't understand a dead gun word. <laughs> and then we, you know, this was in a refugee camp in Thailand, and then we each go back to our camp, and everybody go, whoop, whoop, whoop. <laughs> okay? Imagine that, all right? So that's happened to me in, in Thailand. So, you know, language barriers, it's just... The key is when when I first heard English speaking, it's like a it's like a bird whistle, gentle bird, <laughs> and that that's why you know I bring that up because I think that was the beginning because uh, watching the Ten Commandment didn't know what it was until you know. That's where God is revealing himself to me. And that's what's my journey. And, you know, my journey is not in yet because I told God, I say, I'm not done yet. You call me. I'm not, it's not even begin. I'm, I'm not perfect. I'm a sinner. I'm going to tell you I'm a sinner. I'm, I'm not perfect, man. I maybe go to church and I'm ministers, but if I see you bully somebody, I'm going to stand my ground and hurt you and, you know, I may be a wolf, but I have foundation. You know, there's this defend and comfort other people, you know. The key is we live our life as a spiritual karate guy like me, like yesterday. 
come here. Our brothers, our husband and wife was teaching. She shared a little bit about her father. Mm -hmm. You know, her parents' situations and how she had to just they had to leave after their teaching. Mm -hmm. Um instead of saying, Oh, I do this and I'll pray for you, I pray for them right there. Right there in front. It's uplifting each other. And I'm glad you guys doing what you're doing with karate free training is to help each other learning and feeling accepting other. Yeah. It's called a broken barrel that you break down the wall of pride and and pride is the worst thing. The beginning of life, the devil himself got kicked out of heaven because of pride. Pride can destroy you. Okay? So, what you're doing, it help us to express our ability, our skill, and also help us to grow and build on what? Relationship. And that's what I did. And, and that was just because my brother need a comfort. And I encouraged this strength. I told her, I say. Now is seeking faith, seeking pray, seeking strength for you and your family. So I pray with them. Good martial arts community. Yep. And, and this is why I, I brought this up. And, and, and I, 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 hope, I hope people in the audience recognize that the, the goal here was not to have a religious conversation. Mm -hmm. But I think oftentimes it's easier to understand what something can be by comparing it to something else. Yes. And when you get a bunch of martial artists together who, I, I, I would generally use the word ego, but you use the word pride, and they're very mm -hmm. similar, that, that they are not prideful, it becomes, a lot of people would, will use the word spiritual, and so spiritual that can it can get close to religious mm -hmm. enough so that I, I think a number of people out there have have found some folks who do not train find what we do as traditional martial artists to be so close to religious that they reject it right and i i personally i find a, a very uh, um, good model in a healthy religious community for what we do in a healthy martial arts community supporting each other, putting aside pride, a good minister, pastor, etc. the person in the front of the room is still a sinner. A good martial arts instructor at the front of the room is still a student, right? There's so much correlation there that I really like comparing the two ideas. And that's why I, I wanted you to talk about it. And I'm glad that you did. And so I hope the people out there don't think the purpose here was to make you take religion right but let it mow you we yeah. all student let yeah. it mow you because that's that's one lesson if we let it mow you it develop your character and it help in strengthen our, our ability and our spiritual walk and our growth we are all growing learning to be growing to become a better person the better way you know that's the whole point martial art is 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 just not art of war all the time this peace time mm. harmony yeah. you know but you kind of set this up here i don't know if you saw that it's better to be warrior in a garden than a garden in a war right this katara's what's your katara.com you set that up uh, thank michael you. set that up too yeah. when, when i talked with him yeah but thank you um for uh involving me and inviting me to share and I appreciate thank that and thank you um, for your organization to help develop this for our community and uh, yeah we can't wait for next year and, <laughs> and I'm yeah. definitely supporting this and uh, thank you um, as soon as our facility bigger um, we wanted to do a bigger place bigger gym yeah, and I I, I want to we'll, see we'll I want to see I want to see a hundred some people show up for I, it. I think I only get a hundred next year, and, and you know next year or a year after once my building in, 
we're going to move over and, and do it every That's year, great. and I'm going to get it set up. That's great. So, he, he, here, here's the, the irony. Folks who have been to uh, free training days around the country know somehow free training day almost always ends up at a church. Yeah. <laughs> free training day south outside Atlanta, the one year we did that, the church gymnasium. Yeah. Free training day Midwest when we did that in July, that was at a church. The last three years of Northeast, a religious school gym. <laughs> Somehow, there, there's something about this that I, I find really interesting. And I'm going to have you close us up in a moment. But to the audience, thank you for being here. I hope you've enjoyed this half as much as I have. Remember to support Kataro, K-A-T-A-A-R-O.com. Use the code wk 10 to save 10% on anything that they've got going. And if you want to support us, remember whistlekick.com and everything related to the show is whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. But Samuel, how, how, how are we ending? What, what do you want the audience to think about as we press stop here? Okay. Um, I would just say um, thank you that uh, every one of us that coming together in harmonies and uh, get to share and also learning open um set your mind as flexible mind to willing to learn and stuff no matter what good and bad always remember we're going to learn something you're always going to get that little ingredient um that's going to taste good and you want to take that and put it in heart mm -hmm. and just like the old saying in the south just to put that little stuff in a pot of gumbo you're going to taste it good no matter where you like the flavor of, there's always some kind of different flavor in there. You're going to find you're going to like that. So in, in a more short, it's the same way. So, yeah, um, I want to thank you, my brothers here, and uh, that the organization setting this up and uh, hope it to grow more. And uh, in the future, we're looking forward to every year and not just one time every year, maybe twice a year. So we're looking toward it and I'm, I'm willing to support it. My dojo is willing to support it and uh, I'm looking to that. So thank you very much for inviting me and uh, God bless everyone and uh, be safe out there. That's the whole thing. <laughs>